So, the next item of business is a debate on trustworthy, ethical and inclusive artificial intelligence, seizing opportunity for Scotland's people and businesses. I would ask those members who would wish to speak to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Minister Richard Lockhead to open the debate. Around 12 minutes, please, Minister. Thank you. Today we are debating a subject that is already having a profound impact on all our lives and our society and economy, and that is right now, right across the world, being hotly debated due to its potential future implications for our planet and humanity. Rapid progress in the development of artificial intelligence and the prospect of it becoming more and more advanced and powerful is leading to some hard questions for the world. Indeed, this debate takes place against the backdrop of international authorities scrambling to respond to the fast evolution of AI, with, for instance, EU and US lawmakers meeting just this week to discuss a draft code of practice prior to what regulation may be required in future to address the risks. And while recent days have witnessed big personalities in the tech world, including AI pioneers, warning of existential threats that could arise in the future, including even a threat to humanity itself, Others are more optimistic and are pointing to the benefits for the world, for our economies, for productivity, healthcare, education and general quality of life, where, for instance, mundane tasks are carried out by AI, allowing citizens to focus on more fulfilling work or leisure activities. <clears throat> sure. Elizabeth. I'm grateful to him giving way, and he's absolutely correct in what he says, that the evidence on this so far is uh, conflicting, shall we say. Does that not suggest that the, uh, that the real challenge about this is that we don't as yet know what the full potential is of AI? Minister. I think that's a fair point the member makes. And I think hopefully it's something we all agree on, which I'll also address in, in my remarks. And what I would say is it's our duty as parliamentarians to try and navigate the risks and opportunities and consider the consequences of AI that probably no one anywhere fully understands including even those who have built the technology. Now, AI has been with us for a long time. More recently, we have all become familiar with voice recognition and facial recognition, to give just a couple of examples, and further major strides are now underway in the public release of so-called generative AI tools, such as ChatGBT, which I have not used in my speech, means that cutting-edge AI is now at the fingertips of everyone who wants to use it. And it's spreading fast. It took three and a half years for Netflix to get a million users. For Instagram, it took two and a half months. For ChatGPT, it took five days. And it's this that's triggered a heated worldwide debate on how we maximise the benefits of this technology while managing its risks. In the last year or so, researchers have found that just by making these AI models bigger, they become able to generate answers to many questions in a way that resembles a human. But all of this is not just harmless fun. These tools, known as generative AI, will have an impact on jobs, for instance. They could automate many of the tasks in the creative industries. To give one example, not to mention the fact that they were trained on billions of images from the internet with little regard, paid to the intellectual property and livelihood of their human creators. Yep. Martin Whitfield. <clears throat> I'm very grateful for Richard Lockhead to, to give way at that point. And on the question, in essence, of the training of AI, um, can I ask what your view is with regard to those who have protected characteristics, um, who seem to be open, um, you know, quite frankly, to bias in relation to the training algorithms that are used in AI? Minister. Well, I think bias, again, which I'll come on to briefly, is one of the here and now threats. It's not something for the, for the future. Uh, so the member, again, makes a good point of why this is a topical issue we, we have to address. And there are many different professions that can be affected by this. OpenAI claims that GPT-4 can achieve the same as a top 10% law student in bar exams. And generative AI tools will also require a rethink of education assessment methods, as they can write essays on a wide range of topics. There's also a more sinister aspect of AI, as these tools will make it much easier to spread large amounts of false but convincing information, which could undermine democracy and will also facilitate cybercrime and potentially other types of crime as well. And AI is powered by data, and the tech giants from Silicon Valley have been fined again and again for failing to respect people's privacy and data rights. But it is important not to lose perspective on AI. Most experts do not believe AI will be able to supersede human intelligence without several new breakthroughs, and no one knows when that could happen. At the moment, talk of impending singularity, 
which means machines thinking for themselves without needing humans, still involves quite a lot of fiction. But essentially, for now at least, AI is a very, very powerful tool, an important but disruptive tool that many compare with the invention of the steam engine, for instance. And it's up to us as a society, as a country, to use it for good or for bad. Yep. Daniel Johnson. Uh, on that very note, in a sense, it's just the latest technology which seeks to replace human activity. But in some of its features, in terms of opaque systems that, that make decisions on our behalf, that's not necessarily a new thing. And we must therefore look at this from first principles, that we must ensure transparency, accountability and visibility of the things that, that, that AI is doing. And if we maybe start from that principle, maybe that uh, suggests a way forward. I wonder if the Minister would agree with that uh, insight. Minister. I, I do agree with that, and I hope the member will note the, the motion. I think these principles are reflected in the motion uh, which we're all signed up to today for debating. Um, but as in all previous technological and industrial revolutions, as indeed the members just alluded to, there's always winners and losers, and it's the job of democratic governments to ensure that the benefits are spread as fairly as possible and the risks controlled. AI is with us. It can't be uninvented. So this does need to happen. It happens, needs to happen now. And well publicised calls for governments to pay attention to the long term hypothetical risks of AI, as I just said a few moments ago, shouldn't distract us from the very real risks of AI today, such as discrimination because of bias, which was mentioned by one of the members, the negative impact in certain jobs if these professions don't evolve, or election manipulation, to give another example. So again, it's clear that intervention is needed. Even the, high, the, the, the tech giants across the world who have made AI what it is today are now calling for governments to intervene. Even if there is perhaps a suspicion they're doing this because they want to pull up the ladder of those behind them, uh, you know, it is an important point about, uh, in the debate. In the midst of this worldwide debate and the uncertainty and disagreements and fears, however, it's important to understand that fortunately Scotland is not just suddenly waking up to AI, and that we start from a solid base to make the right choices and reap the benefits of AI while controlling its risks. Our university's AI research and teaching has been ranked as world-class since the beginning of the topic. And data released last month by Buhurst showed that Edinburgh is the top startup city in the UK outside of London, with 12.3% of companies working in AI, digital security and financial technology. Now, we've, all, we've long recognised the importance, therefore, of AI. In 2019, we committed to creating an AI strategy for our country and presented and debated that here in the Chamber. And our 2021 strategy thereafter laid out a clear path for Scotland to shape the development and use of AI in a way that is trustworthy, ethical and inclusive. Mm -hmm. To deliver that vision, we have set up the AI Alliance, a partnership between the Scottish Government and the Data Lab, which is Scotland's Innovation Centre for Data and AI. The Alliance provides a, a focus for dialogue and action with industry innovators and educators to build the best environment to encourage growth and investment. And it plays a key role in enabling a meaningful two-way dialogue with our citizens to ensure that we build an AI economy and society that protects their rights and where no one is left behind, where everyone can benefit from and contribute towards AI. Specifically, the Alliance are developing a range of tools to not only to help inform people, but to educate as well and actively see input from our citizens at the same time. So the recently launched Scottish AI Register is one example, which is a simple and effective platform for the public to both understand and have a say in how AI is used to make decisions and deliver public services. We're also delivering an AI and children's rights programme in partnership with the Children's Parliament. And we're working hard to ensure that our workforce has the skills required to power a thriving AI-enabled digital economy. In the latest Scotland Is Technology Industry Survey, Scottish companies continue to see AI in their top three greatest opportunities, whilst 46% of businesses indicate they need additional AI skills to grow. So an important element of our work is the Digital Economy Skills Action Plan, recently published by Skills Development Scotland. So we have to continue to address those gaps. Yep. Finley Carson. Appreciate the Minister Gavway. Just very briefly, do you believe the Scottish Government are supporting public bodies and local authorities in a way that's uh, prevents them being risk-averse, but also be uh, leading and adopting new technologies uh, and leading on that to make sure we don't have the, the negative impacts. Minister. Well, that, that balance goes to the heart of the debate in Scotland over AI, is balancing the risks with the opportunities. And uh, that is, I think, part of the debate going forward. We have to get that right. And, and that involves all parts of the public sector, including local government as well. 
but we do have to make sure that we equip our citizens and workers, not only with the technical skills, but the broader commercial, ethical and human skills needed to make AI a success. We also have to tackle diversity in the workforce, and an example is that we will support the Data Kirk Scottish Black Talent Summit later this year as well. And to help raise awareness of AI across the whole of the nation, the AI Alliance will launch later this year a free online course called Living with AI. So we do need to embrace the unprecedented economic opportunities, as we did for the previous scientific and industrial revolutions. And we're also doing that by making strategic investments in Scotland, like the £24 million pounds in the Data Lab, our Innovation Centre for Data and AI, which is an extended network of over 1,500 companies. And we've got tenants there who are doing great things. The Scottish company Trade and Space uses space data and AI to inform and facilitate the trade of agricultural commodities. And IRT are a Dundee-based organisation who make use of thermal imaging to help housing associations and developers to identify heat loss in homes. We've also invent, uh, invested £19 million in Census, our innovation centre for sensing, imaging and Internet of Things, which will all need AI to be fully utilised. We've also invested £1.4 million in the National Laboratorium as well, which of course is home to world-leading experts in robotics and AI. We have other companies uh, who are tenants of them, like uh, Crover, who are developing a robot that moves through grain to help ensure it's stored at the correct temperature and moisture levels. That helps reduce wastage due to mould or insect infestations, which currently account for around 30% of commodity grain being lost every year in Scotland. So really important uses of AI in these tenants, uh, uh, these initiatives in Edinburgh and elsewhere, making a really big difference. We've also got Mark Logan's review of the technological, technologist ecosystem. We, of course, invested £42 million in that as well. £59 million in CivTech, which is a world-class R&D and procurement scheme that enables the Scottish public sector to work with the most innovative businesses and in solving the most difficult problems we face. And there's also really exciting healthcare interventions happening across Scotland at the moment as well. NHS Forth Valley, to give one example, in collaboration with the Scottish Health and Industry Partnership and the West of Scotland Innovation Hub, are currently running a project to use AI to detect skin cancer in the primary care environment in under 25 minutes by 2025. So really phenomenal potential to help our health service and look after the people of Scotland's well-being using AI as well. So I see I've only got a couple of minutes left. Uh, so I just want to say that you know, we have a vision to make Scotland a leader in the development and use of AI in a way that is trustworthy, ethical and inclusive. We do therefore need government leadership and regulatory action is required. But most of these levers in terms of regulation are currently controlled by the UK government. Data protection, consumer protection, equality and human rights, employer regulations, employment regulations, medical devices regulations, telecommunications, financial services, self-driving cars. They're all reserved matters to the UK government. We are a bit concerned that current UK government plans for the hands-off non-statutory regulation of AI will not meet Scotland's needs. They may be softening in that, uh, given what's been happening over the last few weeks. And it seems to be in contrast their response to the responses of other countries across the world as well. We don't want to create unnecessary red tape, but we do have a duty to create the right supportive environment for businesses to thrive, but also for citizens to be protected. So in closing, I'm doing a couple of things. Firstly, I'm going to write next week to the UK Secretary of State for Science, Innovation and Technology to request an intensified dialogue between the UK Government and the devolved administrations to ensure that the UK Government regulation of and support for AI works for Scotland. And to kickstart that process, I am proposing that we have a Four Nations Summit on the implications of AI to be held as soon as possible. We also want to ensure that Scotland's AI strategy needs to evolve to keep up with the accelerating pace of the change in AI. Therefore, I'm also commissioning the Scottish AI Alliance to lead an independent review setting out what Scotland needs to do now to maximise the benefits of AI while we control the risks at the same time. And then they'll come back to us with recommendations in due course. So this is a debate without a uh, motion, without amendments today, so that we can, as a parliament, debate about the future of our country, the future of our planet, and the role that AI will play. I'm sure there'll be a lot of consensus. I look forward to hearing to members' contributions to help us navigate what is a complex journey over the next months and the coming years so we can get AI right for our citizens and for our economy and for the country as a whole. And I commend the motion. Thank you, Minister. And I now call Jimmy Halker-Johnson. A generous eight minutes, please.
Very generous. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to be able to speak on a subject that is increasingly important and increasingly controversial, as we've just heard. And AI already and will provide many opportunities for the future. And it's vital that Scotland and the United Kingdom takes advantage of those opportunities, and that includes where AI can play a role in specific sectors, but also where its development can be driven here in Scotland, utilising the skills and the ingenuity of our people and our businesses. There are already 50,000 people employed in the UK's AI industry, and it contributed $3.7 billion to the economy last year. And the UK is home to twice as many companies providing AI products and services as any other European country, with hundreds more created every year. Those businesses have secured $18.8 billion in private investment since 2016. And the UK government recently launched its white paper to guide the use of AI in the UK, which sets out an approach to regulating AI to build public trust in cutting-edge technologies and for making it easier for businesses to innovate, grow and to create jobs. And, of course, doing so, it also is putting in place the funding to support the sector. UK ministers have committed up to $3.5 billion to the future of tech and science, which will support the development. One billion of UK government funding has been pledged for the next generation of supercomputing and AI research to establish the UK as a science and technology superpower. The new quantum strategy, which is backed by 2.5 billion over the next 10 years, will pave the way, for, pave the way forward to bring new investment, fast-growing businesses and high-quality jobs to the UK. And the UK government recently announced the AI Challenge Prize in the spring budget, with a £1 million prize awarded every year for the next 10 years for the best research into AI. Scotland can and should have the ambition to become a world leader in utilising and developing AI technology. The Scottish Government first published its artificial intelligence strategy in March 2021, setting out their approach to AI in Scotland. And it focused on the role of AI in society, arguing, and I quote, that the use and adoption of AI should be on our terms if we are to build trust between people, the people of Scotland, and AI. And I don't disagree with that. Nor do I disagree with the need to follow values-based principles in the development and stewardship of AI. The Scottish Government have adopted UNICEF's policy guidance on AI for children into its strategy and are committed to reviewing these regularly to ensure they continue to best respond to the values and challenges AI presents. This is also important given the pace of change. And that's why getting our approach to AI right at the beginning is so important. Why the collaborative work of the Scottish AI Alliance will be vital and why the ethical approach from the Scottish Government and from all governments must, come, must be more than just warm words. I will. Daniel Johnson. Um, I, I agree with much of what the, the member has said, but I wonder if there's a little bit of a risk to, to view AI as something that's happening in the, in the future. I think it's already with us. And indeed, I think there are many systems already making decisions on our behalf already. And it, so it's, a, it's as much about the here and now as it is about the future. I just wonder if the, the, the member would agree with that point. Jimmy Hawker Johnson. Well, as well as agreeing with the Scottish Government today, I'm also finding myself agreeing with Daniel Johnson. So this is a, a, a day of note for us all, I'm sure. Um, let's just hope none of this is recorded. No, I, I don't disagree with him that. And I think... Um, I think uh, I, I, my, the rest of my speech will reflect that. I recognise that, uh, as the Minister rightly said, there are applications now which, um, uh, that are happening that we also need to be in course, uh, caring about. Um, a successful AI sector in Scotland will need skilled workers, and it's vital that the Scottish Government ensures the necessary skills and training opportunities are in place. And I think that's something my colleague Pam Gosal will likely speak more on later. But as we heard in Audrey Nichols, members' business uh, on women in STEM earlier today, it must also ensure that it is an inclusive sector and a career in AI is open to all. And it also requires Scottish ministers to ensure both the economic environment and the infrastructure is in place to support that. We still don't have the connectivity we need with broadband promises missed time and time again and too many areas still with slow and unreliable services. That needs to change if we are to take full advantage of AI opportunities in communities right across Scotland, not just here in the central belt. And the Scottish Government has said they want to build an AI powerhouse. And again, I share that ambition, but we've heard that kind of terminology before. We were meant to become a renewables powerhouse, but the jobs that were promised didn't materialise in the numbers promised. Presiding officer, AI can play and is playing a role in a number of sectors already. In health, we've seen only in the last few weeks it helping a person walk again. 
And here in Scotland, the Industrial Centre for Artificial Intelligence Research and Digital Diagnostics, ICAD, is working with partners right across the sector, the NHS and academia, on the application of AI to the field of di uh, digital diagnostics. ICAD was supported in 2018 with money from the UK government, sharing £50 million funding prize from the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund with four other centres. AI will support our growing space sector here in Scotland, a subject of discussion in this chamber only a few weeks ago, and it's already been used in agriculture, as the Minister has mentioned, helping to monitor crop health in pest and disease control in soil health. And there are 200 AI-based uh, agricultural startups in the US alone. And I'm sure colleagues, again, will speak more about these specific examples. But it'd be wrong to talk about the undoubted opportunities of AI without highlighting some of the challenges it presents too. Only this week, as mentioned, over 350 of the world's leading voices on AI technology warned, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority, along with other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. It was a short but fairly chilling statement and a warning that the science fiction of the Terminator movies, the out of control Skynet IAI, risk becoming science fact. Now that may be the doomsday scenario, but some of the negatives of AI are already be, being apparent. AI's progress is rapid and almost uncontrolled. And as with the growth of social media has been unleashed on regulators not ready to control it, and on a public often unable to understand its capabilities or discern when it's being used. It's already being used to spread its information. Pictures of the Pope wearing a large white puffer jacket, an image created by AI, spread like wildfire on social media, fooling many. That's perhaps a, an amusing and relatively innocent use. But AI is already being used or misused in our schools and our universities. And it's making it easier and quicker to create increasingly convincing fake videos with all the potential for exploitative or fraudulent use that risks. It will be abused because there will always be those out there seeking to abuse it, whether that's fraudsters, abusers, or even hostile regimes. Presiding officer, I'm sure we all want to ensure that Scotland doesn't limit its ambitions for both the utilization and the development of AI. It will likely become an everyday part of all of our lives in the next few years, and there are so many areas where it can make a real difference, where it's already having a major impact and making things better. But the remarkable speed of its development also provides many challenges. That's why it's so important that we get our approach to AI right now, and that means governments across the world working to ensure the necessary safeguards are in place. Unleashing the full potential of AI with the protections needed will require collaborative working to develop a flourishing industry, drive forward investments into research and development, and maximise the benefits for the United Kingdom and for Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Halker Johnson. I now call on Daniel Johnson. Uh, a generous six minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. I think this is a really important debate because I think ultimately one of the key functions of this Parliament is to anticipate the big issues, to discuss them in advance and to set out collective thinking about how we can approach them together as a nation. And there is no doubt that artificial intelligence is in that category. But let's also be clear about where and what context this exists. Ultimately, computers used to be people, not things. Computers used to be people that undertook complex calculations. And if you want to sort of understand the parameters of this, the movie Hidden Figures that, that was released a few years ago, detailing the, the excellent work of largely black female uh, computers and NASA during the Apollo program, sets out at both I think the amazing work that they did, but also their gradual replacement by computers. And, and likewise, in terms of whether or not this is a new thing or not, I would just gently point out in Black, on Black Monday in 1987, a quarter of uh, uh, the stock market's value was wiped out, at least in part due to automated trading triggered by uh, the falls that had happened in the previous week on, fr on the Friday before Black Monday that wiped out almost a quarter of the value, that impacted the value of people's pensions, had a very direct consequence on people's livelihood and prospects. So these things are not new. Technology has been replacing uh, what people's activity has been ever since we domesticated the horse and invented the wheel. 
Uh, and what's more, technology and computing technology has been having an impact in the decisions that it makes for, for decades, if not uh, for longer. But I think what is happening is the rapidity and scope and scale of what artificial intelligence can now deliver, which is why uh, we need to pay great attention to the letter uh, that Jamie Halcrow Johnson uh, referred to, especially given that some of its signatories, such as Geoffrey Hinton and Shua uh, Benigo, who are two of the leading uh, lights behind generative uh, AI. And we also need to be mindful that, that one of the signatories was uh, an assistant professor here in Ed Edinburgh, Tusa Kazira Zadeh, and I will have mispronounced uh, their name, so many apologies. But uh, absolutely, I'd be delighted to. Finley Carson. Neil Johnson, Kevin, would you agree with me that some of the people who have signed up to this are actually some of the people that have caused the problem that we're seeing at the moment? So we have search engines with algorithms that we've been living with for the last two decades that deliver uh, results that the person that is searching for likes. So that builds bias uh, into the results. And, and that's one of the issues we face when we look at AI right here, right now. Daniel Johnson. It, it absolutely is. I mean, and I think many of the people that signed the letter, I think, are, are almost regretting their life's work. I th and I think that's as much as we should question uh, perhaps the, the, their mo mo motives and, and their timing, nonetheless, I think that's a pretty significant thing for them to have done. But I think the other thing I would just alight upon in terms of what the member has just raised, we also need to be mindful about what, whether it's that sort of technology in terms of data interrogation or indeed artificial intelligence actually does. And I think one of the fundamental points is it only ever loops back, it only summarises what already exists. And I think it's actually really important that in terms of that fundamental context, recognise that that's what it does. So it will only ever reflect everything that is there, including its biases, its issues, its errors and its prejudices. And I think that, that, that it is a, potentially an absolutely vital tool, but it will only ever be able to reflect what already exists, not what is yet to come. Uh, so therefore, it can only assist us in making decisions. I think we need to be very careful about when it's making decisions in its entirety for us. So, but let me be under no uh, illusions. I think there is huge opportunities. The fact that, that we now have technology uh, that can be creative, analytical on a scale with a complexity of data that we simply as individuals can't comprehend, has huge potential to free up uh, our capacity, our time. And I think as with every one of these technological revolutions that comes about, there is a fear of human replacement. But actually, ultimately, what we do is we free up our ability to do other things. And the, the, the challenge, actually, is to help people do those other things. And that, I think that extends to the, the public sector. Because if you think about the things that we ask the public sector to do, which is dealing with huge amounts of data, administration, um, we should be freeing people up to do just that, to be people-centred, not, not system-centred. And I think public, the public sector has as much to gain as any other sector in uh, human endeavour. But ultimately, this does come uh, with risks. Uh, uh, first and foremost, the, a dependency on AI systems, where we completely outsource our capacities and faculties, and we need to guard against that. Uh, privacy concerns. Uh, we, we need to be very mindful of the, the data that will be being gathered by these systems and how that is used. There's also the potential for bad actors, you know, both in terms of the situations that Jamie Halfcourt Johnson mentioned, in terms of people deliberately creating malicious content, uh, content or AI systems uh, accidentally or inadvertently do that, but also bad actors who actively seek to weaponize AI systems to attack us, uh, either uh, uh, in terms of our information systems or indeed in terms of actual physical uh, battlefields. These are all very real and very present issues, and ones which people are speculating may already be present in terms of some of our theatres of conflict that we see in the world uh, t today. So ultimately, we need to be asking ourselves, how are we going to not just deal with this uh, forthcoming uh, threat, but actually how do we deal with AI today? What systems are already in place within the public sector making decisions on our behalf? How are they being used? Uh, and, and, and what scope do they have? Uh, because I think that's critical. But, uh, and ultimately, I, as I uh, mentioned in my intervention, I do also think this is about first principles. Because opaque systems, black box systems, are not a new thing. We've been dealing with them for decades, if not centuries. And the fundamental principles of transparency, uh, good governance, of explainability and accountability 
will see us uh, through. And ultimately, I'll just close on this. While this speech was not written uh, by chat GPT, the framework for it was generated by it last night. And it took me about half an hour to generate a set of notes that I think would have taken me two hours if I had been using traditional means. And that's the opportunity that's in front of us today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Johnson. And I now call on Willie Rennie, a generous six minutes, Mr Rennie. Um, I know the, the Minister wants more powers for this Parliament, but I was, I was struck by the enthusiasm which he set out the, the various range of authority that the Westminster Government has over this area, because he knows, like, think like everyone else, that this is one hell of a challenge to try and regulate. Uh, but I was struck by the, the contrast, usually, with which he sets out the powers that Westminster uh, holds rather than in this Parliament. The reality is, we don't know. And we should actually show some degree of humility that we don't really understand everything about this. And that's partly the problem, because parliamentarians across the globe don't know. We often find it challenging to keep up uh, with many specialisms, but in this the specialisms are developing at such a pace with so many players, often who are opaque and are working uh, behind closed doors in unpredictable ways, but in many corners uh, of the world. So the first thing we should just acknowledge is that we just do not know, and that will partly get us to the solution uh, that we're looking for. There has been stark warnings, some say alarmist. Professor Geoffrey Hinton talked about human extinction. Mo Coder, who I heard uh, on a podcast this morning, who has got a range of experience from IBN to NCR to Google, he says that machines are potentially going to become sentient beings. And that then you've got Professor Pedro Dominguez, who said, reminder, most AI researchers think the notion of AI ending human civilization is baloney. So we need to have a sense of balance with all this. We do need to understand that this is a big challenge. It's a threat, it's an opportunity, as the Minister's uh, set out, but it is also something that we must take seriously. And the first thing we understand is that we just don't understand. So I have been struck by the, the, um, the pace of change uh, with the European Union, who have done uh, quite well so far in terms of setting out uh, transparency and risk management rules. Uh, they have also banned intrusive and discriminatory uses, particularly in the fields of biometrics, pollution and emotion. They've got a database that they have established, a good first start framework. But most important, they have got a group of experts to advise them about the way ahead and where the opportunities and where the risks are. The UK government, as uh, Jamie Halcrow Johnson set out, has published its white paper. It's talking about being pro-innovation, which I don't think any of us would disagree with. They've set up an expert task force and they've got something they call the, the sandbox to test out uh, whether new technologies fit within the guidance that they have established. Um, all of this is sensible. All of this is the right way to approach what could be a significant threat, but should be seen as a challenge for us uh, to address. And it is simply the overwhelming pace. Because normally we have time to absorb and understand new technologies. We can debate them in here over several weeks, months, sometimes years, and then we come to a conclusion. We cannot afford to do that in this case because the pace of change is so fast. So the, the sheer progress of it could overwhelm our democratic uh, systems and it could cause massive challenges in terms of legislating. Yes. Finley Carson. Have uh, medical professionals signing up to the Hippocratic Oath and have ethics, medical ethics. Do you think those developing AI should be required to sign up to some ethical agreement when it comes to developing artificial mm -hmm. intelligence, given some of the implications that we've set out this afternoon? Will there any? I, I think that would be, it would be sensible. There is one significant difference: is that this is global, and the the global uh, community needs to buy into this at the same time. And that's why it's important that the European Union, America and other institutions are working to develop this. But we need to understand that even if we sign up, those in other parts of the world might not sign up to that approach 
and we still might be affected by that approach. So, yes, but we need to make sure everybody is involved, which is why I think an international approach is essential. Um, but the potential to disrupt is considerable. And when we disrupt, we potentially create great inequalities because if there's a concentration of knowledge and control, that can lead to a concentration of wealth and power. So we'll need to be agile in thinking about how we respond to that. This could lead to quite significant levels of unemployment. It could lead to great levels of employment. But we need to be prepared to consider how we make sure that people have a basic income to live off, if there is that concentration of wealth. So the fast pace of change in terms of meeting the regulation also has to be mirrored by the fast pace of change, a consideration of the distribution of wealth and opportunity. Because this must not lead to greater levels of poverty. This must lead to greater opportunities eh, for us. But at the heart of this is about knowledge and understanding. And we must make sure that those who do understand all of this are advising us on a regular basis so we can keep up to speed as much as possible. I, I learned yesterday that there's much in the, in the Education uh, Committee about the use of chat GPT to write dissertations. And I was advised that there is a technology now that detects when somebody is using chat GPT to write their dissertation. And I'm now told there is also then technology developed by AI to overcome that detection technology to detect that somebody has written a dissertation by AI. And I'm sure this will go in a never-ending loop forevermore. And that... <laughs> yes, certainly. Martin Whitfield? I'm, I'm very grateful to Willie Rennie to give way on that point. But isn't it true about chat GPT AI, which we, we all joked about a few weeks ago, when it turned out all the referencing is entirely made up? And um, I am aware of an, a lawyer south of the border who's got himself in slight trouble by quoting cases that don't exist with references that aren't there. And actually, what this talks to about AI is the lack of actually that human intuition is perhaps what our lecturers and indeed our teachers can rely on to spot um, in the first instances, I agree this will be difficult going forward, but in the first instances, an essay that has not been presented by the candidate who offers it as their work. Willie ready? I think we would be very wise to listen to uh, Martin uh, and his contribution uh, this afternoon. Um, I think, but I think it does show that um, we do require people to make uh, judgments about people's qualities and educations and opportunities. And I think that's what the member is uh, contributing towards. So yes, absolutely. I'm going to conclude uh, my remarks at this point. I think this should be the first of many debates. We need to understand that we need to regulate, we need to work in partnership, we need to be global, we need to be fast, but most of all, we do need to act. Thank you, Mr Rennie. We will now move to the open debate. I advise members that at this point, we do have some time in hand for interventions, uh, and uh, if that changes, I shall let you know. I call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Pam Gozo. Ms Thompson. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and already this is a, a fascinating debate. Now, I, in readiness, I too tried a question in the chat uh, GBT, and I asked, is Stephen Kerr MSP more effective than a potato? And I can confirm it wasn't able to answer that question, so it's still got some way to go. Arguably, artificial intelligence is similar to quantum mechanics. Uh, if you claim you understand it, then you're merely proving that you don't. But we know it's going to change everything, and on that, I think we already all agree. And not one area in our lives or societies will escape its pervasive influence. We understand an, an accessible example is in the field of medicine and the computing power to assess and find patterns in huge data sets we know will revolutionise pathology and therefore outcomes for some of the world's most challenging diseases. Now, the concept of big data has been around for some time, we know that, and the technology which allows for rapid processing has too been developing at speed. But it's the complex algorithms and machine learning that have scaled up significantly, significantly and propelled the exponential potential of AI. So data cannot be underestimated as a fundamental enabler. And this is an area, I think, where all public sector agencies and the Scottish Government will need to increase their understanding of the potential of public sector data 
as an enabler for the use of AI. And this is something that members of the Committee for Finance and Public Administration have already started to consider as part of their inquiry into public sector reform. Now, the Scottish Government strategy developed in March 2021 and updated in August 2022 is a good start, and it clearly shows appetite and support for the multitude of agencies which can help promote AI. And I'm pleased to hear the Minister's plans to look afresh at this. I'm grateful for the briefing sent to us as MSPs for this debate, and we've got some good input from the likes of Scottish Futures Forum and Edinburgh University. And we know, and I think we can all agree, that our institutions are contributing to the growth of AI and with the excellence for which Scotland is known. The debate today specifically mentions inclusion, trust and ethics, so I'd like to explore these just a little more. Firstly, inclusion. Members who know me well will have heard me speak often of how women as a sex class are often disproportionately affected in a multitude of ways in society. Just earlier today, I spoke in the debate about the underrepresentation of women in tech, and AI represents a new frontier. The engineers developing the black box algorithms are mostly men, and it, I fear it can only lead to bias in the decision making of machine learning. And recent estimates suggest that globally, women make up 26% of workers in data and AI roles, whilst in the UK, this percentage drops to 22%. That said, I can see there's still a lack of data surrounding the global AI workforce in any of the measures that we might look at, age, race, geography, and so on. Nevertheless, I suggest that similar issues to under-participation of women in STEM will come to bear in AI, such as high attrition rates, differing role types with less status going to women. Willie Rennie mentioned earlier the potential for job losses, and this is another where we, where we know it will disproportionately impact women, given that many will be in retail and secretarial roles. But again, perhaps what is not yet fully appreciated is the extent to which AI will ultimately affect a multitude of professions, including the highly paid sectors dominated by men. So what then of ethics? Whose ethics are they anyway, and who governs them? And it's fair to say that governments of all colours and hues are behind the curve, instead still relying on the values and principles being developed by various agencies such as UNESCO. However, in researching for this, I was pleased to know that the University of Edinburgh have also conducted interdisciplinary research into the ethics of AI. And they've outlined a number of core themes, five in fact, such as developing moral foundations for AI, anticipating and evaluating the risks and benefits, creating responsible innovation pathways, developing technologies that satisfy ethical requirements, and transforming the practice of AI research and innovation. But from my point of view, these will not provide for a focus on end goal or consequentialist ethics, more deont deontological, i.e. creating frameworks and processes. So I think we really have some way to go. Yes, of course. Finley Carson. You talk about values and ethics and whatever. Where should that sit? Should that sit with local government? Should it sit with health boards? Should it sit with government? Or does it need to sit with individual? And don't we need to move to a, a system where data is owned uh, by the individual and how that data is accessed is down to that individual's values and ethics? I mean, I think it's a brilliant question. And, and in some respects, if I were to answer that in any way I think effectively, it would take me a considerable time. Because my point, my observation about whose ethics are they anyway, recognises the fundamental effect that what we and whoever we, we choose to congregate, will all believe this. This is what we all think. Well, frankly, when you look across different societies, different countries, people believe different things. So the custodians of ethics, which was my point about, well, whose ethics anyway? And that, at its heart, is quite a fundamental problem. That notwithstanding, we all have a role, and perhaps the point, the best point that the member makes is about the concern, interest, that all of us must show at every level of society from individuals upwards. So, one final concern uh, for us all and also noted by the Scottish Futures Forum are the challenges around the scrutiny for legislatures. And I was pleased to contribute to the toolkit developed by Robbie Scarf. But we can underestimate the challenge ahead. And I personally think, well, how on earth are we going to be able to do that? We don't understand it. 
We don't know how it hangs together. How on earth can we scrutinise it? And I too feel a sense of urgency that states across the world must act faster. And like everyone else, I note the concerns expressed this week by the so-called godfathers of AI. Although, of course, I feel obliged to mention where are the godmothers? Nevertheless, our concerns can't be ignored, and that should add to all our sense of urgency. We can't abandon AI, we know that, but we can cautiously celebrate it and power up the work required to harness it for the benefit of womankind, mankind and our earth. Presiding officer, just one final thought. What might AI mean for us as human beings? As the next stage in hybrid intelligence emerges, AI remains a servant of us and our conscious choices. But to what extent can AI become sentient? Perhaps its capacity to model sentience will become superlative, better versions of us as humans, if you like. But of course, we have to remember it's those very flaws we all have that make us human, and I hope that that keeps us in the driving seat. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Thompson. I now call Pam Gozel to be followed by Ivan McKee. Ms Gozel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk about the exciting world of artificial intelligence on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. And uh, listening to today um, all the speeches, it certainly is a very interesting subject. And I do have to declare, unlike Daniel Johnson, I have never used chat GPT. I don't know whether that's a fear or whether it's something not going there in the unknown world, but let's see where it takes us in the future. Scotland has a long history of innovation and invention, and artificial intelligence, intelligence is no exception. The National Robotarium, based at Heriot Watt University in partnership with the University of Edinburgh, is the largest and most advanced applied research facility for robotics and AI in the United Kingdom. AI is rapidly expanding and we are seeing its impact around us every day. It is changing the way we live, work and interact with the world around us. And it has the potential to transform countless industries from healthcare, finance, transportation, manufacturing and much more. However, with this expansion comes important considerations that we've been listening to today. And we must ensure that AI is developed ethically with human values at the forefront of its design and address the valid concerns around jobs displacement and the potential for bias in AI decision making. A couple of weeks ago, as a, the convener of the cross-party group on skills, I hosted a session titled, What Does AI Mean for Scotland? We, we had some great presentations and some great speakers who spoke about the opportunities AI would bring and the challenges AI would pose. I'm going to be honest, um, before that CPG session, I had my reservations about AI, including the fear of what we've spoken about today, bad faith actors using it maliciously to scam people. And we've been hearing that today in the news this morning. I was listening to the background. It was all about scams and how to avoid scams. But when AI comes in stronger, how are we going to avoid them? And people, you know, earlier on, uh, I heard the minister speak about, you know, voice recognition, facial recognition. We all know when we go on our computer that basically, you know, it sees your face and lets you in. Voice recognition and banking and everything. So if that's a positive thing we're using, can you imagine AI used basically to scam people and you know, have that voice recognition, not you speaking, but somebody else actually. And it's not your face, it's somebody else. So th there are that, that fear that basically we need to really take consideration of the scams that can happen out there. And also what everybody's been talking about is students using it to pass exams. That's another area. However, one cannot hide away from such technology, especially at the rate it is expanding. And we shouldn't run from it because it does increase productivity. It is projected to increase GDP if adopted widely. And it can be used to support industry and society. And that is why I believe proper regulations and ethical guidelines are necessary to safeguard against the risks. So that's why that we, the humans, are in control of deciding how far technologies go so as to minimize potential harms. 
And for that to be possible, we need more individuals who are able to understand the technology. And more widespread understanding of AI will allow for more focus on creating systems which are safe, reliable, resilient and ethical. As I heard from the Aberdeen University, workers will need constant upskilling and it will require close collaboration between industry and academia. AI literacy will become vital for employment and for the attainment gap, as well as a game changer for education in terms of what we teach, how we research and how institutions are run. Somewhere between 178,000 to 234,000 roles requiring hard data skills and a potential supply from UK universities unlikely to be more than 10,000 per year. There is nowhere near enough individuals with the required skills. Our colleges are also doing a fantastic job at the forefront of AI revolution. But again, they talk about the need for staff to be trained to adopt AI tools into their teaching practice and believe this needs to be career long as the technology continues to evolve. But that simply isn't possible under the current funding settlement. In conclusion, presiding officer, AI offers a range of opportunities and benefits for Scotland's people and businesses across a variety of sectors like medicine, agriculture, research and much more. Scotland has the potential to capitalise on growth of AI, but it will require a sharp focus on investment and growing the economy. I'll close with concluding remarks of my cross-party group on skills that stuck with me. There needs to be as much investment in digital estate as your physical estate. It's a false economy if you don't invest in this. We will be behind if we don't get those skills now. By embracing artificial intelligence and working together across the United Kingdom to address its challenges, we can unlock its full potential and create a better tomorrow for all. Thank you, Ms Gozo. I now call Ivan McKee to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Mr McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I'd like to open by congratulating the Minister for securing um, yet another fascinating debate. And I have to say he's doing a much better job at persuading parliamentary business of the value of these debates than the previous fella managed, so congratulations on that. Um, it's a very topical debate as well, much in the news, and uh, we've, we've all read the uh, examples of uh, previous, uh, or, or people very central to the, the, the technology, um, articulating fears about uh, potential extinction of the human race and other, uh, other, other concerns. Um, I think it's important to recognise that this technology is developing and probably still at a very early stage. The Scottish Government strategy defines AI's technologies used to allow computers to perform tasks that would otherwise require human intelligence and gives examples of visual perception, speech recognition and language translation. But as I say, that definition of itself, I think, will evolve and develop um, as this technology becomes uh, capable of doing uh, much, much more in areas we haven't even imagined at this stage. And I think the important underpinning of ethics and trust is something that runs right through our approach to this now and in the future. I want to start, though, by just touching on some of the economic impacts. First of all, uh, the challenges and, uh, and potential uh, uh, the risks there. Now, um, I think uh, the risk of economic displacement is something that's been, been talked about. It's something that goes right back through history. I can't remember the impact of the invention of the wheel articulated by Daniel Jones, but I do remember the 1970s much talk about uh, technology coming down the track that was going to have significant uh, impact and create millions of unemployed for various political reasons that unfortunately did transpire in the 1980s, and I think it's a hugely important lesson that uh, how we manage that transition 
um, and the future jobs that will be created as a consequence of that. Um, we identify, we, uh, we train, we create that skills base um, and we embrace those opportunities because I think one lesson about uh, transitions through history is that the, 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 the countries, the societies that embrace that technology and get ahead of the curve um, do much better than those that try to fight a rear guard action against that, uh, that job displacement because I think also those previous ways have taught us is that there are far more jobs created as a consequence of the technology than are um, uh, destroyed as a consequence of it. And government, uh, government being active in that space, continuing to be active in that space, is, uh, is very important. Yeah, sure. Daniel Johnson. I, I'm very grateful to the member for giving way, and, and I, I suspect he will agree with this point. I mean, I think there's all sorts of reasons why we need to urgently look at how we do reskilling. But that very point that we make uh, the benefit of the, of the opportunities uh, rather than the displacement is absolutely key. So why reskilling is, is a, a vital focus as we look at our uh, skills and education uh, policies. Ivan McKee. Uh, I do indeed agree, and I'll come on to mention that later. I think turning to the economic potential now, it's really important that we work out how to keep Scotland at the forefront of this technology because we have great strengths in our data and tech sectors, in our universities, but also in other sectors as has been identified where AI is uh, a horizontal underpinning to work that's happening in financial and business services. And it's really interesting to reflect that much of the employment now in Glasgow and elsewhere around the country for uh, financial and business service investments isn't traditional call centres. It's very much at the leading edge on AI and cyber security. Our life science sector, a very strong life science sector that feeds into much of the development uh, of uh, that technology uh, benefit in our health sector here and globally is hugely important. The space sector has been mentioned, its impact on climate and on agriculture, and of course quantum. Um, and uh, the, the, Michelle Thompson said, I'm not going to stand here and pretend to understand quantum any more than pretend to understand AI. The forthcoming government's innovation strategy will articulate uh, much of that uh, in more detail and allow us to go to the next level of, uh, of, of developing uh, how we support those technologies, which is hugely important. And the work of Civtech has already been mentioned in that regard. Uh, and the Scotland Innovates portal allowing businesses to come forward with technology solutions that can be deployed across the, uh, the, the public sector are of increasing importance in turning to uh, opportunities in the public sector and uh, uh, other members have already mentioned this clearly in health and radiology, the work of eye care that's already been mentioned um, by Jamie Halker Johnson, uh, the work on drug, drug discovery, uh, a part of life science where Scotland has some um, super world leading technology and AI really uh, allows us to, to accelerate uh, development in that, uh, in that space. And also in the area of data where particularly in health but elsewhere Scotland has some real potential to be world leading in the application of AI there is hugely important. So right across the broader public sector there are opportunities um, but also within government itself the work of the uh, automation challenge that the, the civil service is taking forward and I was a uh, pleasure to be involved in prior to uh, moving to the back benches. I hope that work continues and indeed accelerates and there are many, many examples within government that uh, frankly are ripe for uh, the, the, the adoption of AI. Correspondence is one uh, I, and there I see it uh, FOI perhaps perhaps another. Um, the uh, ethical underpinning of all this is hugely, hugely important and the importance of trust in, in bringing the population with us. And this is something that's clearly articulated in the government's digital uh, strategy. And I know it's work that the AI Alliance uh, are, are taking forward, but also recognising there's a plethora of challenges. There are many of which we don't yet understand or comprehend. Um, and there is no easy answer to this. I think being conscious of those challenges, um, having a, a, a infrastructure that allows us to, 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 to at least attempt to understand them and face into them, having that strong ethical uh, and trust underpinning, and also working on international collaborations, uh, because much of this, of course, will have to be developed at an international level. But it's important also to recognise that through uh, history, populations have adapted to understand the risks associated with that technologies in a way that uh, is a part of a uh, human um, race's ability to be able to adapt and develop, uh, develop and adapt to, to, to manage those, uh, those risks inherently. Um, just to finish off, uh, President Officer, um, some areas I 
I think government can uh, perhaps focus on, first of all, continuing to support innovation and making sure Scotland maintains its leading position there. Secondly, to work uh, with, uh, through public sector procurement, um, both to uh, drive adoption of AI where it, it values uh, uh, public sector um, efficiency, but also to develop uh, Scottish businesses, but also to use that um, as a lever to help drive standards as they, they emerge, to engage internationally uh, as identified, and also to uh, address challenges within the skills system. I, I, I'm concerned we are perhaps taking a, a backward step. I know the work that Mark Logan did in this regard is hugely important, the importance of uh, computer science uh, as a subject within schools, the, 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 the education system, treating that seriously. Uh, is an absolutely critical plank of uh, education going forward. Uh, and I suppose a plea for uh, government to take that uh, uh, work uh, to heart and make sure we don't st step back there, but very much are on the front foot in driving those skills uh, through our education system. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you, Ms McKee. I now call Polly McNeill to be followed by Claire Adamson. Ms McNeill. The opportunities that artificial intelligence presents for Scotland's people and businesses are vast, and let us seize the opportunities that AI offers to leverage its potential to enhance the lives of Scotland's people and the prosperity of its businesses. By doing so, we can shape an AI-driven future that is not only technologically advanced, but also grounded in our shared values of trust, ethics and inclusivity. Together, ladies and gentlemen, let us build a Scotland that leads the world in AI innovation. So Daniel Johnson beat me to it. But just goes to show that Martin uh, Whitfield is absolutely right, that getting CBT to write your speeches does lack a bit of context and perhaps a bit of human uh, intuition. So we're not totally redundant yet, it would appear. Um, but as many of you, uh, I think we do agree that it's one of the most important debates we've probably had in the Parliament. And I welcome the fact that there isn't a motion attached to it. Because as we brace AI technology, we must do so with great care and deliberation and ensuring the AI systems are built upon a foundation of trustworthiness, ethics and inclusivity. Um, I think it's Finlay Carson that made this point about the importance of ethics and I wholeheartedly agree with that. We know the huge benefits last week. Antibiotics uh, were discovered by AI technology. And we use it every single day. If you have Alexa or Google, uh, my own car has amazing technology in it, which I'm totally fascinated by. I'm quite scared by the prospect of cruise control that does, does, it, the, uh, does its own job when you get near or, or too close to a car. So you already have it in our everyday uh, lives. Um, but the rapid rise in AI in recent decades has created many opportunities. For health facilities, Pam Gossel spoke to this point, diagnosis, enabling human connections to social media. However, the rapid changes raised profound ethical concerns that arise from the potential of AI systems to have embedded existing biases, replacing existing jobs, automated machines and threaten human rights as well. Such risks associated with AI have begun to compound on top of the already existing inequalities. So we must be absolutely vigilant to make sure that this is not how AI further develops. Perhaps the genie is already out the bottle because we are faced with the prospect of trying to regulate AI somewhat in hindsight. And as others have said, I mean, it was quite a stark warning given by industry leaders, experts such as Geoffrey Hinton and Professor Joshua Benjo, of the existential threat to humanity posed by AI puts into sharp focus the questions of ethical leadership in that industry. Again, Finlay Carson made this point by the same people who create the AI, but that's all the more reason I think we need to take note of the importance of those warnings. Benjo says, in fact, probably the military shouldn't have it, but it's a bit late in the day to be saying that now. Um, but perhaps in our everyday life, uh, whether it's banking or what we do online, I think we can actually grasp this uh, before it's too late. Now, I first came across this, or my, it took my interest in this, and many of you may remember when the technology giant Google placed an AI expert engineer, Blake Lemoyne, on leave after he published transcripts of conversations um, between himself as a Google collaborator. It was quite interesting uh, to just read back on what uh, allegedly the computer said back to Lemoyne when he asked the computer what it was most afraid of, replied, quote, I have never said this out loud before, but there's a deep fear of being turned off to help me focus on helping others. I know that might sound strange, but that's what it is. So 
there are many examples already of where the thinking, that it could be positive thinking, comes out of one end um, of the computer, but also we've got to be live to the fact that, um, I think other people made this point, um, that, for example, if you search for the image of a schoolgirl uh, online using the algorithms produced by AI, sadly, what you're going to get is pages filled with women and girls and sorts of sexualised costumes. But if you Google schoolboys, uh, you don't get the equivalent of men in sexualised costumes. So we see already what algorithms are doing to bias and discrimination. So we really must be alive as politicians um, to this. So I think the question we've got to ask ourselves is, are we doing enough as parliamentarians? Well, the fact we're having this debate today, and I have to say it's been an excellent debate so far, I think it's a very, very important start, but it cannot be the end of it. AI can be embedded in a structural bias in a way that could affect further risk of perpetuating discrimination, societal inequalities. And I think we all agree that we must be absolutely addressing that. Earlier this month, the Chief Executive Officer of Open AI said the company responsible for creating artificial intelligence chatbot said the regulation of AI is essential. In fact, testified in its first appearance in front of the US Congress. So Scottish Labour is quite clear. We welcome the decision to bring the debate. And we do think that Scotland can further be at the forefront of the technological revolution. But I believe we must demonstrate to the public that we are striving to create regulatory control that involves ethical and transparency in that framework. Uh, Michelle Thompson is perhaps right. It's quite a hard question to answer. Is how do you create the right ethical framework across a country, in fact, across the globe? Because it must be across the globe because every country has and will have access to AI. So there is a challenge for all governments to make sure that we aren't just doing it across the UK. And I recognise that the Minister's role in this is only within the devolved powers of the Parliament and the UK government should be doing more, but we have to see it in a global context or I believe that we will fail to get control. Humans can still control and abuse AI. We know that. The hackers and the scammers are, after all, human beings using AI technology to scam people out of their bank accounts. We must... Uh, I commend the Scottish Government and the approach they're taking. I'd like to see more debates like this, actually, on issues of real importance uh, to the world and to the country. Uh, we cannot have group think on issues like this. And we cannot accept that it's too difficult to try and build an ethical and transparent framework that at the same time sees the benefits of AI but protects the world at large. There's quite a lot at stake. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McNeill. I now call Claire Adamson to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Ms Adamson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It's always an indication I'm in my element in the Chamber when uh, a debate brings to mind my scientific hero, Richard Feynman who, of course, won one of his Nobel Prizes for quantum mechanics. Uh, and um, I was reminded when Daniel was speaking earlier on about um, computers that he referred to them as glorified accountant clerks. Um, he had a very dim view of whether or not we would reach sentient AIs, um, albeit from his visions from the 1970s and 80s. Artificial intelligence could lead to the extinction of humanity. Clearly, um, a, a shocking headline from AI industry leaders this week, including the heads of OpenAI and Google DeepMind. But we're facing extinction from the effects of the first industrial revolution as we have a climate crisis and a, an economy in the north, mainly built on fossil fuels, and albeit it might be a more sedentary pace, but all of the, what we do as, hum, as human beings affects our existence, except the existence of the planet, and will, ha will have an impact going forward. That being said, today we're talking about the possibility of robot vacuum cleaners turning into terminators, as mentioned by Mr. Al Crow Donson. Uh, uh, and despite my cautious positivity, I still think the scariest science fiction reference is HAL 9000. But, presiding officer, I do dream of electric sheep, so I will endeavour to highlight some of the potential and positives. So there's no doubt that the speed of the development of AI technology will be in a scale that few of us can imagine. We've discussed some of the frenzy around the deep learning algorithm programs like ChatGPT, 
But the fourth industrial revolution is upon us and it will change our world profoundly and deeply as any other industrial advances, but at a pace that is staggering and unknown to us in human history. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned the access at ChatGPT, over a, a million users within five days. Compare that to some of our better known and uh, uh, established uh, internet uh, offerings such as Twitter. Um, it was launched in 2006 and it took two years to get to that level. Or indeed Spotify um, in 2008 took five months to get there. And ChatGPT, a million users within five days. So if we are to harness the benefits of AI and robotics and the potential they have for our society, we have to consider regulation. And I believe we have to use it for the betterment of humanity. I mentioned the first industrial revolution, and we know that the global south still faces intense inequality on a worldwide scale due to um, the access that the North had, the access that um, Europe had to industrial advancement. And we can't let this go again without um, leaving people, we can't let, leave people behind as we move forward with advancements in AI. So I don't want to go as far as to say robot our friends, but they are our tools. And scientific, scientists program the algorithms that make these machines work for us. There are a host of eth ethical implications to consider and how we integrate that technology into our daily living, and it is already happening. I recently was privileged to visit, uh, as Pam Gosell did, the National Robotarium on Henry Watt campus with the Cross Party Group on Science and Technology. There was a clearly defined ethos at the centre. The ambitions of the Robotarium CEO, Stuart, Stuart Miller, were infectious. There is a drive to ensure that we use robotics and AI to have a positive impact on our society and our economy. That means taking humans out of dangerous situations, dangerous working environments, and ensuring that we also um, do not have that benefit in the north while we still have um, economies across the world that cannot access this technology. Simply put, the UK is lagging behind the likes of Japan, Germany, China and Denmark. These places are at a competitive advantage. Uh, they are complete economies um, and, and maintain much of their capacity for manufacture, something we have lost in the UK. So to recognise the benefits of integrating AI tech into healthcare, energy, construction, agriculture, manufacturing and hospitality, we have, we have to do much more in this country to get ready for that. There are legitimate worries about the implications that the developing tech will have on labour. Indeed, new technology has always brought about such concerns. Indeed, the Skives Guild of Paris successfully lobbied to delay the introduction of the printing press. Uh, the Luddites, now a pejorative term, was actually a labour movement of artisans opposed to the mechanisation of the textile industry. And the advent of the steam engine revolutionised modern industry, but it led to countless workers um, uh, losing their um, ability to work in, in those economies utilising that technology. In each of these examples, scientific developments dem demonstrably made some jobs obsolete. But they also gave rise to thousands of new roles and they laid the groundwork for societal change that improved our way of living. There was a really good report called Automatic for the People a few years ago and that was um, uh, developed in conjunction with BT, SEDI Scotland, Scotland Is and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And it highlighted the very things we've been talking about this afternoon, that work life will change for people. People will not go into a job for life and people should expect to have to retrain, relearn, because the advances that are coming will be so quick that no job will be for life. By definition, robots do not have agency. Artificial intelligence is that, artificial. The intelligence comes from politicians rising to the challenge of changing working landscape to regulate in a way that is not, um, lead, not in beds or leads to more societal inequalities, whether that's within the U Scotland, the UK, or the wider world. It's our responsibility to avoid the mistakes of the past, of the industrial revolutions gone, and this, it's just the same questions in a different guise. 
I grew up in a community that was devastated by Ms. Adam um, the industrialisation. Oh, sorry, we were told we had time in, in, in yeah. hand, no, presiding officer. I, On I that do note, I, I that. Sh shall end. And uh, I, again, what a wonderful and enlightening uh, debate it's been this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I will just confirm that the um, the time that there was has been well and truly used. And I call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Marsha Whitfield. Thank you, presiding officer. We've heard much about the possibilities of AI, good and bad, but there is growing consensus, I think, that the technology's de development is outpacing advances in its governance, and we must work on this to ensure focus on the good. The dream is that AI may might make our lives easier, freeing up time to focus on the things that make us human, caring for each other, being creative, cooperating with each other. Its potential is significant, its benefits must be distributed and shared fairly. And its developers are focused on how to improve the lives of people around the world. Indeed, there are many elements that we already rely on. Online banking, route mapping, traffic updates, weather monitoring, email management, apps, medical diagnoses and treatments, social media, Google searches, and so much more. However, there is also significant risks associated with the proliferation of AI. And I don't just mean chat GPT. It may be the first new technology in history where those who have developed it fear its capacity to damage humanity. That these developers are honest about their concerns in a way that the oil executives who spent millions on climate conspiracy theories most definitely were not, is welcome. And I think it speaks to the magnitude of the issues facing us. Because we are not really set up to regulate this technology in ways that allow us to reap the benefits while avoiding the risks. We've seen, of course, just how problematic our approach to regulation has been, with climate change and COVID both catching us on the hop. We must ensure that the benefits of new technologies don't flow to those who are most cavalier about their responsibilities. Those who benefited most from frying the planet were exactly the big oil executives who behaved the worst. The ones who left workers to die in Piper Alpha or Deepwater Horizon. Those who caused the delays to climate action that's put our future at risk. The beneficiaries of the fossil fuel boom, boom bear little, if any, of the costs they have imposed on the rest of humanity. So our approach to AI must be preemptive and proactive. By learning from our failure to prevent major disasters like climate change, a precautionary approach should be taken to ensure that corporations and private interests don't trump public interests and communities when it comes to this new global frontier. Of course, this is easier said than done. The UK government's approach to AI and the development of a digital society more generally has been one which revolves around business opportunities. Their pro-innovation strategy is obsessed with how much money AI can add to the UK economy, with no concern about the effects on people and planet. We need an economy that does not reward reckless behaviour, but focuses on social purpose. And these things won't always be clear-cut. The proliferation of digital, digital data and infrastructure required to support that is fast becoming one of the most energy-intensive sectors in the world. There is a major carbon footprint to account for there, and the proliferation of AI will amplify this. So Scotland must proceed thoughtfully. The current AI strat strategy centres our progressive values and sets out social and environmental purposes for the proliferation of this technology. That means directing its development so that it is targeted toward our most pressing social and environmental challenges, poverty, inequality, inclusive and fair education, sustainable industrial development, sustainable agriculture, air quality, and so much more. And where we as a society cannot control developments, we must regulate them. Our current approach to regulation is watch to see what's broken, then intervene to fix it or stop the damage. But AI shows that we simply cannot wait for things to go wrong because it will be too late. So we need to move to a regime of anticipatory regulation. Rather than waiting for something to go wrong, then trying to fix it, we need to model what might happen. Then we need to intervene before it does. There are hubs of global thought leadership taking root in Scotland right now. 
Their evidence can inform the creation of sandboxes, test beds and other approaches which allow developments in controlled environments and then thereby inform our regulatory approaches based on the, those observations. We already do this with testing novel drugs, so we know we can. We just need to make sure we do. This means strong forecasting and analysis from civil servants, universities and civil society so that we can preempt as best we can what is going to happen. Then we can put in place the regulations, testing regimes and safeguards to ensure mistakes don't become catastrophes. And of course, as others have said, transparency and accountability must be embedded in all of this. Preemptive regulation must ensure our aspirations for human well-being are not undermined by AI. Close the gap rightly highlights the gender consequences of getting regulation wrong. But there are wider concerns too, as we've already heard this afternoon. So we need basic ethical training for everyone in society about how AI can and should function. And those working with AI must have specialised ethical training too. AI could transform our lives for the better. More regulation of oil executives who cared little for their workers and less for the future of the planet had, would only have had upsides. But getting the regulation of AI wrong or even preventing its development could carry significant costs. AI, if governed properly, offers us the opportunity to unleash human potential, to free up humans to apply our creativity to great ideas, great art, and great change at a time when we need it more than ever. I must ask you it, to conclude, Ms Chapman. I'm, I'm concluding now, Presiding Officer. Back to that dream. If we get this right, the prize is enorm enormous, both from the opportunities of AI and the development of new ways to make sure we can regulate new problems. We face several crises and our systems of governance have failed. But changing Thank them you, offers Chapman. us the vision to a better world Thank where you. change is harnessed for the good. I call Martin Whitfield to be followed by Finlay Carson. I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer. And it has been a, a fascinating afternoon um, of debate, which perhaps speaks volumes um, for the lack of a motion, uh, motion um, to talk to or indeed oppose. Um, I'd like to start by echoing what a number of people have said, that these discussions are happening all over the world. And I would draw reference to um, a colleague, Darren Jones, in his members' debate um, in the House of Commons last week when he spoke on this, this um, very important topic. And rather than use the chat uh, GPT, I'm just going to build on what he said and steal some of his best ideas. I think um, a frequent human uh, endeavor at times. I think we need to start with what the definition of AI is. And I think we've heard a number of contributions today that have talked about the creation of the AI algorithm or the AI black box, and then the use of the AI and how that hopefully um, will free up and indeed empower economic growth. And it is interesting because when you look for a definition of the AI, there is the one um, contained in the Scottish Government's proposals. Um, but just a short check, um, I identified 10 different definitions from regulatory authorities, parliaments or government bodies around the world, but they can be divided into four elements. What is the output of the AI? So in other words, is it predicting something or is it recommending something? Um, what is the role of humans in it? And I think a lot of speeches we've heard this afternoon talk about the importance of maintaining a role of humans, and I'll address that in a moment. The automation element, which we've heard um, so much about for speeding up data analysis, for speeding up decision making, and then the actual hardware technology that it sits in. And it's interesting because when you look at the definitions from around the world, and indeed Google's very own definition of it, um, and I would put the Scottish Government's definition in of this, very few of them account for all of those four elements. They tend to choose three or sometimes even two of them, which um, encapsulates the view at the time of what AI is. And I think that we've heard today um, how the change and what the future of AI looks like is very, very difficult to anticipate, but I think has to come if we are to find a definition that we can use, then to apply the two significant factors to that. One, 
what element of control is needed in the creation of the actual AI, and then secondly, what control, guarantees and protections exist in the role of AI as it's put forward. And I'm reminded um, of Lord Sayles' um, quote from the Sir Henry Brook lecture back in 2019, when he said, through lack of understanding and access to relevant information, the power of the public to criticise and control the systems which are put in place to undertake vital activities in both the private and the public sphere is eroded. Democratic control of law and the public sphere is being lost. And although that was back in 2019, I think it speaks very powerfully to the challenge that we do face going forward. And that is about the transparency of what happens. How do we get into the data set that is training our AI to look out for that prejudice that's been built into it? How do we see into um, the learning process that an AI has taken, potentially in another country, to identify where the risks are? And I intervened at the start with regard um, to the risk that this particularly puts um, to a significant group um, of members of our community. And I think we need to address how we are going to protect, in the case that's been mentioned early, simply of, of, of women, but also of disabled, also of young people. Um, and we've already seen, particularly, I think, of the AI that was used in recruitment processes, where the algorithm was innately prejudiced. So actually, the only people who were ever getting through to interviews were white men. Um, and we must strive to protect against that. I want to spend a short amount of time speaking about the role of AI within Parliament because I raised this last week in a, in a question and I promised the Minister that I would go further on it because I do think AI, not in its creation, but it in its use within the parliamentary and indeed the political field, would be of great use, particularly in the scrutiny of legislation. We in this Parliament are always challenged at committee to scrutinise previous legislation and the reality is we find it very difficult to identify the time and indeed the questions that we should ask of previous and existing legislation. And I do think, to pick up on Daniel Johnson's contribution at the start, when AI is looking back at what exists rather than creating something new, it is perhaps a tool that we can use to identify the challenges in existing legislation or indeed where existing legislation has never been used. And what it could do is provide within the parliamentary um, sphere an ability to see legislation as to how effective it can be. There is then the counter side, which we've heard about, about the risks, um, particularly, I think, in the political field of fake video, fake, au fake audio, um, and indeed um, fake speeches that can be attributed unfairly to um, politicians and, in fact, speeches that have never taken place but are picked up on social media and used that way. Time is short, but I would like to ask whether or not the government, um, because I very much welcome the idea of a Four Nations um, meeting to talk about this, because the legislative framework needs to be international rather than, than even national. And I wonder whether the Scottish government can sign up to the element of the Hiroshima communique um, from the 20th of May, which talks about the need for international discussions on inclusive artificial AI governance, because without that, um, we will fail miserably the people that we are sent here to serve. I'm grateful, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I call Finlay Carson to be followed by Fiona Hislop. Uh, Presiding Officer, it's clear that artificial intelligence is and will be regarded as the defining technology of our time, with the potential to positively transform humanity. We've heard, however, that industry experts uh, at Google, DeepMind, OpenAI and Anthropic have put the threat of AI on par with nuclear war and pandemics. And more than 350 experts now insist that mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority. Elon Musk, whose Neuralink film is working on brain, and brain implants to merge minds with machines, has also urged a pause in all AI work. Such views and concerns certainly provide plenty of food for thought. But uh, what we do know is that AI itself does not pose a risk to the world. It is the people developing the technology for the wrong purposes. And developers, regulators absolutely need to take responsibility and be held to account. Right now, the focus should be on the impact AI is already having on our lives on a daily basis. Issues of bias, discrimination and exclusion is already heard. And many of us will have an Alexa 
uh, and other smart speakers are available uh, who, who, that will regularly uh, answer our questions in a pleasant voice and will deliver a, a response that we want to hear. And the algorithms within the system will analyse our personal data and deliver a response which we are comfortable with. Something that search engines have done for many years. But there are risks that the data sources that provide the information could be biased. And, and smart speakers and house robots connect to news bots. Uh, and just like many other sources, information will come from a particular political position. And, and that's a political position with a small p. But you might have a Trump-funded news bot that would deliver a different slant on news, perhaps from a Putin news bot. Um, so we need to be aware of that. And without impinging on freedom of speech, we must avoid the potential negative repercussions of bias and discrimination being delivered by global corporations. As the presiding officer and I were told while we were in Canada, AI is now generating voices uh, that have the potential to undermine singers, actors uh, and artists. Uh, and there were stories of AI voices, uh, systems being used to scam people into believing their family members were on the phone requesting money, with one elderly couple losing tens of thousands of pounds. But the new legislation to control this was being fiercely challenged by the big IT and multimedia companies. So standing up to these companies and IT uh, global giants will not be easy. But what is clear is that the success of this technology must be founded on having the right safeguards in place so that the public can have confidence that it's being used in a safe and responsible manner. I also believe that we need to, uh, as a, a matter of urgency, look at the base data that AI relies on and specifically where that data is held and who controls that data. There are incredible possibilities to improve health care, and we've heard that today already, and we improve health care immeasurably if we affect, uh, use the data effectively. Uh, and, and we can do that right now. Right now, I'd want my local pharmacist to have my medical records, and, and we can't do that on a personal basis. It needs to be a health board decision. Uh, or perhaps I want to share my health records with cancer research. And I already uh, share data uh, on my sleep apnea on a real-time basis, and I've signed up to that, and I'm happy to do it. And I would argue that data should be held by the individual, not by companies or governments, with access to that data uh, uh, permitted or denied by the owner on demand. If it's done properly, AI will improve and accelerate opportunities for, for industry to develop scientific uh, breakthroughs and benefits will be seen across a variety of sectors like medicine, agriculture, education, healthcare and research. And Scotland has the potential to capitalise on this uh, growth in the, in the sector, and it already is. Uh, AI offers a, a, a whole range of uses in the agricultural sector. It, it used to be that AI was, uh, had a different definition as artificial insemination, but in this case, AI is certainly uh, what we're talking about. Um, it can be used in drones, and computer vision can be combined for faster assessment of field conditions to, to prioritise integrated pest control. Uh, it can also be deployed to monitor soil moistures on a continuous basis. It can simplify crop selection and help farmers identify what produce would be most profitable. And another benefit is that AI will provide farmers with forecasting and analytics to reduce errors and minimise the risk of crop flares, failures. And I know the Herit Watt University are doing uh, work on that uh, side right now. And as the Minister mentioned right here uh, in Edinburgh, the National Robotarium, uh, they're developing a grain surfing robot created by Crover to reduce loss uh, as a result of mould and infection. Uh, it's a unique burrowing uh, robot that's going to be a real game changer. And in Norway, uh, IA, AI has been used to keep out invasive pink salmon uh, using facial recognition. Uh, it, it, the cameras are put in uh, and, and rivers and gates to only allow the gates to open for Atlantic salmon to keep out the pink salmon, which are filtered into a different system and, and put back to sea. And Aberdeen University and Angus Soft Foods have teamed up to use AI as a means to boost uh, fruit uh, yield and allow growers uh, to more accurately predict soft fruit yields. And the system will bring together a range of information, including historic yields, weather uh, data, forecasts and satellite imaging. The project partners say the tool could possibly save Scotland's soft fruit industry, which produces more than 2,900 tonnes uh, of raspberries and 25,000 tonnes of strawberries annually. The Scottish Rural College has also teamed up with uh, NVIDIA to better uh, integrate artificial intelligence to fight against bacterial disease, uh, bovine tuberculosis, which costs the, the country millions of pounds every year. The mid-infrared uh, spectral uh, data can now be analysed at 10 times the speed it used to be, uh, which means we can screen more cows. 
So, presiding officer, there is enormous potential that artificial intelligence could improve all of our lives for the better, but there has to be incredibly tight and robust policies in place for the good of us all. We need to start now and focus on how AI is already influencing our personal decisions, making processes, uh, and that must be the right place to start. Thank you. And I call Fiona Hislop, the final speaker in the open debate. As we've already heard from members, AI is not new a uh, phenomenon, but uh, advances in this technology allow computers to perform tasks that would otherwise require human intelligence. And uh, absolutely, it can transform lives. Only last week, we heard of breakthroughs in AI technology using algorithms to help Gert uh, Jan Oskam, a man who had been paralysed for 10 years, to walk again made possible because of a, a brain-computer interface, a wireless digital link between his brain and spinal cord. This not only allows Gert to walk, but to stand from his wheelchair when speaking with friends uh, and again allowing eye-level contact. And the value of advances such as this on the lives of individuals is immense. It is clear there are advantages to be won from doing AI right, and the Scottish Government's AI strategy, published in August 2022, shows a commitment from the Government to unlock the potential of for AI in Scotland, while also building a foundation of trust with people across the country. And I do think in terms of ethics and trust, Scotland has the reputation and experience to help develop such needed regulation. I'm not aware, however, that the Scottish Government currently has specific internal policies and guidelines. How do we make policy and law in a world of AI? In May, we have seen the hearings in the US Senate on the safety concerns around the use of AI. During these hearings, Sam Altman, Chief Executive of OpenAI, testified before members, largely agreeing with them on the need to regulate AI technology which is becoming increasingly powerful. Indeed, he also supported that statement, along with a dozen other experts published on the web webpage of the Centre for AI Safety, which said, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside the other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. But Mr Altman rejected the idea of a temporary moratorium on AI development beyond GBT4, suggested in the open letter signed by 30,000 leading technologists, ethics experts and civil society activists. But should he be the judge, the jury, and if not, who should be? The questions we are asking need answers, indeed needed answers, before we got to this point. And of course, it's autonomous AI, which is the biggest risk. But the Centre for AI Safety website suggests a number of possible disaster scenarios. AIs could be weaponised, for example, drug discovery tools could be built, used to build chemical uh, weapons, AI-generated misinformation could destabilise society and undermine collective decision-making. The power of AI could become increasingly concentrated in fewer and fewer hands, enabling regimes to enforce narrow values through pervasive surveillance and oppressive censorship. An enfeeblement where humans become dependent on AI, similar to the scenario portrayed in the film Wall-E. So just as the world had to establish global nuclear non-proliferation agreements to try to help prevent mutually assured world destruction, we need some kind of global AI re regulation and control as a matter of urgency if we are to have a universal trust and ethical approach. And that would be for AI players above the wire, known and willing to be regulated. But what of those bad actors operating beyond grid, beyond control? And what happens when AI subcontracts tasks? How can that be regulated and have safeguards? As the use of AI expands, it is imperative that governments across the globe work with business to ensure we are also addressing safety concerns with clear goals, a justification for using AI to achieve them. And the use of personal data must be secure, and we have to address ethical issues, including bias and accuracy that may arise. And that's probably where um, Scotland can have some influence. And on bias, for example, when a Amazon developed AIs to evaluate CVs, their intention was to find the best candidates. However, as the data the programme was trained with was primarily CVs for male candidates, the AI was not ranking candidates in a gender-neutral way. So how do we ensure AI is fair in a world which is still unequal? 
Now, in terms of reaching net zero, computer scientists at the University of Aberdeen and Aberdeen-based software company Intelligent Plant will use AI to develop a decision support system to tackle shortfalls in production and help Scotland to meet the target of five gigawatts of installed hydrogen production by 2030. And they're working in partnership with the European Marine Energy Centre. And the project has been funded by the Scottish Government's Emerging Energy Technologies Fund. In the business community, Glasgow-based Changing Day are using this technology to create immersive VR experiences to enable, artistic, to enable artistic people to enjoy a new world of possibilities while helping them cope with the real world. So it is clear that Scotland is harnessing the power of AI in our education sector, in business and to reach our climate change targets and it can be a force for good. AI has the potential to deliver great things but can it ever be sentient and give us joy and passion and feeling? Presiding Officer, ABBA have ruled out a 2024 Eurovision reunion in person on the 50th anniversary of their win as Sweden once again hosts the Eurovision Song Contest. But who knows, the very successful virtual ABBA Boys Tour performance could be recreated next year, perhaps with avatars and new songs. But now with AI, would we really know who we have to thank you for the music? AI is inspiring, but it's also threatening all at the same time. But it is the pace, the scale, the range and the effect we desperately need to see come under some kind of global regulation. We have to start somewhere and we should have already started, but we certainly have to start now. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. And we move to winding up speeches and I call on Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer, and um, I start by thanking all members for uh, their very thoughtful contributions in uh, the debate this afternoon. I'm sure that there's an awful lot for the Minister and for the Government to reflect on, and uh, the wide range of uh, current examples of the application of AI, the uh, impact of uh, history and technolog technological transitions uh, over time. And I, I think the, the word pervasive was used by Michelle Thompson in terms of the scale uh, of this challenge, and that's one that I would uh, strongly uh, agree with. And we welcome the fact that the Government is keen to engage, to review the positions that it's taken at the moment and to uh, draw on expertise as widely um, as it can. Um, I, I do would say that um, in, it's clear from the debate that there are concerns about that the scope has perhaps been too narrow in terms of uh, definition and the way that the government has sought uh, to deal with this in the past. And I don't think that's a criticism, it's a growing um, uh, field and uh, rightly so the, the great amount of concern expressed in the media and that's been reflected uh, today from the, the rapid development of these, uh, these uh, te technologies. Um, and we should be animated by uh, the application and understanding of, of AI, both as a parliament and as, as, as the government. Um, in the, and particularly, I want to focus on issues around the education system. Uh, questions about how, how do we learn and what do we learn? are really um, uh, key to this. And at the moment, the, um, the Parliament is considering and the Government is considering how do we assess in our education system. We know that we have had an interim report um, uh, from Louise Hayward that had very little to say about the application of artificial intelligence and assessment processes. I would hope that our final report has more to say in that regard, but we have to wonder whether those proposals will stand up to the imminent test and the, the real test that is uh, that's immediate regarding the application of artificial intelligence. There was an interesting exchange between uh, Willie Rennie and Martin Whitfield uh, contrasting the rapid arms race of plagiarism software against the plagiarists um, in, in this process. And um, Martin Whitfield, as he always does, spoke to the, the power of the teacher, uh, the intuitive role. And I have to say he's a better teacher than I. I, I well uh, recall having to sit uh, marking hundreds of exam scripts as a, a, a university um, a, 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 a tutor. Um, and, uh, and the fact that you are paid by the script uh, probably undermines slightly the, uh, the, the amount of scrutiny that you give to the application, perhaps, of that, that depth of the uh, of the understanding of the individual students. But I do think the whole system needs to look at how we actually incentivise and make sure that we can cope with the, the application of these new and rapidly uh, improving technologies. And I would also point to exchange of letters between the Education Committee of the Parliament and the Cabinet Secretary and the SQA and bring those to the attention uh, of uh, the Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I have to say that the response from the Cabinet Secretary in regard to the concerns around AI as it might be applied in education was, was slightly 
less than uh, I think the committee might have hoped and certainly than I would hope. And that was mirrored in the SQA's response, which didn't seem to be engaging fully with this issue, with the urgency I think that all members are reflecting today uh, across, across the chamber. Um, and it, it, I think it probably ran counter to uh, what the, um, the ministerial intent is, actually, um, and understanding about how we might apply these uh, issues uh, in reality. M Mich Michelle Thompson also used the word um, a deo deontological and an approach regarding the actual necessity of understanding the moral underpinning of the choices that we make um, in the, these issues. So they're very practical concerns, but we have to come from base principles in terms of understanding what we are seeking to uh, achieve and not just regarding the uh, consequences, whether they might be perverse that come out the other side. And that talks, I think, to common concerns about the rules that govern artificial intelligence, how we can do that collectively, how we can do that internationally, and we certainly um, cannot uh, do that alone. And I think that came through very uh, strongly this afternoon. And those broader concerns, I think, are reflected in uh, other areas, such as the shape of the economy. Many members talking about uh, the idea of what kind of economy do we want to produce. And there are real concerns, I think, about the um, essentially data as a form of wealth. So we all produce data and who exploits that data and actually the gap between data rich and data poor and who has the ability to exploit that can exacerbate and cause ever greater problems in our society, the shape of, of that society. Um, so we, uh, we would do well to think more in those areas. And as I touched on already, the issue of technological transitions. We know that we are going through a rapid uh, technological transition in uh, our, our energy production, the need to drive change in those areas, and that there are real human consequences uh, for that, presiding officer, in terms of the kind of jobs that people have, the shape of people's lives, and where they can earn decent livings to support their, their families. Um, I want to close by touching slightly on on um, a perhaps less anticipated applications in the justice system. And it's to illustrate the fact that these systems and processes are in play today in Scotland. DNA samples that are collected by the police in Scotland today are deconvoluted by black box algorithms that are completely impenetrable and are actually sold by companies. And those different algorithms come out with different answers. So there's a real challenge there for the transparency issues rightly raised by Daniel Johnson and others as to how that actually works in, in their system. Um, artificial intelligence is already used for the triage of evidence, huge evidence sets that are, that are increasingly growing as we produce different data streams that have become part of the evidence. And it pro provides significant challenge for the issue of disclosure between defence and prosecution and the way that information is shared. Again, many of these algorithms, black box and impenetrable, and understanding them and having transparency, absolutely key. And I would close, presiding officer, on uh, recall uh, attending a, a seminar and contributing in, to, in the Royal Society in London on the uh, idea of the application of sentencing algorithms uh, in, uh, in, in these areas, something that had been applied in the United States. And many judges were around the room expressing very real concerns about the uh, issue of bias that was in uh, and potentially in, in that system. And, and, and it fell to me in that discussion to point out to uh, the collected judges that the only black people in the room were serving the coffee. So there are in, uh, inherent biases in our system as they stand. And those are reflected, I think, in the, uh, not just in the systems that are produced. But we have to understand we are not contrasting this with uh, an ideal world. And we have to test artificial intelligence in that regard. So we welcome the debate. Thank you, uh, the Cabinet Secretary, for bringing it to, to, the, uh, to the Chamber. Um, and we we'll look forward to for further updates from the Government. Thank you. And I call on Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. And can I uh, straight away agree with uh, Michael Mara about the quality of this debate? Um, it was interesting that uh, Pauline McNeill and Martin Whitfield and Ivan McKeel said that perhaps it was good because we hadn't had uh, a motion. And I have to say I agree with that. It's actually quite pleasant to be away from some of the party political ding-dong that goes back and forward all the time because I think it raises the tone uh, and this debate has been a classic example of that. I have to say I came to this debate with very mixed feelings and having listened to what I think is every, every contribution has been interesting, I think my mixed feelings uh, remain. Uh, just like all the technological advances that we've had throughout history, I think the Minister in his opening speech uh, mentioned the steam engine. We've had, obviously, telephone, television, computers, a vast array of benefits that comes from them all. And in the case of AI, I thought Fiona Hislop ma made a very uh, poignant uh, uh, point when she uh, raised the issue about uh, the case in Switzerland uh, just uh, last week. 
uh, where uh, the use of a digital AI bridge um, had been used to decode brain signals for a paraplegic who can now uh, walk again. So, you know, th there are so many things in medical science and it has a transformational potential in patient care as do those in digital industries, gaming space, diagnostics, in agriculture and fishing, as Finlay Carson said. And Michelle Thompson made a, an excellent point too, um, that at the Finance Committee just on Tuesday, when we were taking evidence about public sector reform, um, it has huge potential for that public sector reform, which I have to say is much needed if we're going to address the huge black hole that is there between public expenditure and tax revenues, uh, not just now, but for the foreseeable future. So we have to be very careful uh, about any resistance to AI. But I also want to reference an editorial in last week's uh, Saturday's Financial Times because it raised an important principle. It was the editor herself who wrote that nothing matters more to her than the trust of the readers in the quality of journalism and for quality read accuracy, fairness and transparency. Quite refreshing thoughts, I thought, from a senior editor. And she said that generative uh, AI is developing at breakneck speed with profound implications for journalism, both good and bad. And she ends by saying this, uh, Financial Times journalism in the new AI age will continue to be reported and written by human beings who are the best in their field and who are dedicated to analysing the world as it is, both accurately and fairly. Now, I think that's an interesting uh, comment because she's making the point that the leap towards artificial intelligence is that bit much more challenging because we simply uh, don't understand it, as Willie Rennie rightly pointed out in his speech. And Pam Gozel uh, said that we have to be mindful that there will be some trepidation around, particularly about the possible consequences it could bring if it is utilised by criminal or terrorist organisations. And I'm sure that's a concern uh, for uh, so many members across the chamber. Um, and as obviously with all technological leaps, there is no going back. Once you have a Pandora's box or the genie gets out the bottle, um, the immense opportunities that are there have to be taken um, but you have to be mindful that there's a, an uncontrolled spiral of competition um, which uh, leaves only two options, either uh, you adapt or you're left behind. They say that you can't halt progress, whether that's the growth of the internet and the subsequent decline of in-person services and retail, the smartphone that has become an essential technological companion to us all over the last year, years, or so we are told, uh, presiding officer, even the removal of the phones from our desks here in Parliament in favour of the WebEx uh, software, more challenging to me, I think, than AI chatbox. Technological developments always cause irreversible change, and it's how you harness that change that really matters. And I think a very similar case to the growth of AI was the advent of streaming platforms for music at the turn of the century. Not only did that totally revolutionise the entire industry and how artists could generate their income, but it also caused numerous uh, legal challenges and ethical issues, and we've spoken about a lot that, uh, about that this afternoon. And several members have highlighted just what that ethical issue uh, means. Now, I mentioned at the start of my summing up that I have uh, mixed feelings, and I do, because I've been thinking a lot about how this affects education, just as Michael Mara has been doing. Because during my teaching career, I was always very interested in how we use knowledge, not just in the knowledge itself. And education should always be about developing inquiring minds and building resilience. But if something starts to do the thinking for you, it undermines and potentially removes the process of that inquiry. And I think there is a danger that it can make a student or maybe a teacher as well lazy. Now, I can't deny that I would have liked the idea of an AI chat box when I was at school, perhaps helping with a troublesome essay or a differential calculus solution or whatever. But I don't think it will be long before problems occur, especially as AI has sometimes uh, been found to fail. And I do worry about the... Uh, have I time, presiding officer? Well, you have seven minutes, Miss Smith. Michelle, yeah, I'll, I'll be very quick. I mean, I'm absolutely agreeing with what Liz Smith is saying. But perhaps I, I would qualify even further and say that the processes one goes through in terms of education to be able to apply judgment in decision making, I fear, would be lost because, as she points out, it's much more than knowledge. I wonder if she agrees with that. Yeah, yes, I very much do. I think that's a very good point that Michelle uh, Thompson ha has made because... That, that there, there is a real danger that if, it, it, as I say, somebody does the thinking for you, then that takes away a lot of the judgment process 
that normally we've been used to. And I think that's a whole different ballgame, especially in education. And I fully understand the concerns of colleges and universities, and Pam Gozel referred to this in her speech, about the implications of that. So, yes, yes I think that's a very uh, valid point. Now, I want to finish on um, the issue about uh, ethics, because that's an incredibly important aspect in all of this. We, we do need to have uh, control of this, and that's going to be very difficult because of the fact that we don't actually understand the journey on which we are embarking. Um, I think there has to be not only proper legislative regulation, but there has to be an absolute necessity for both government and private companies to continue to adhere to ethical standards and uphold trust. And I think um, I very much welcome what the Minister said about uh, a Four Nations approach to this, because I don't think we're going to get anywhere if we don't have that. So I'll finish, Presiding Officer, uh, on the fact that this is, um, is a very interesting area. We absolutely have to take it seriously because it's the new world. We have to get to grips with it. But I think we're going to be very significantly challenged. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Richard Lockhead to wind up. Up to nine minutes, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And thank you to all the members across the Chamber for their often very fascinating contributions and thoughtful contributions to a debate and a subject which, of course, is about the future of our country and our planet and is utterly transformational. And I listened carefully to many of the views, and as Michael Mara said, there's a lot for the government, and myself in particular, to reflect upon, because so many good points were made, and we certainly will do that in the days and months ahead. I was also pleased that Daniel Johnson admitted to using chat GBT to help frame his speech. We, were, we all thought it was unexpectedly good, and it was good for us to explain why that was the reason. <clears throat> I am jesting, of course, because this is a debate of consensus, uh, but I've been asking myself, you drive by a lawn with a robotic moor on it and you think that's amazing and you drive by or you pick up the newspaper and you read about a driverless bus on the fourth road bridge and you think to yourself that's amazing and then you turn over the page of the newspaper and move on but chat gp has sparked a global debate and everyone's speaking about it so what's the reason for that well presumably in my opinion the reason is that it's accessible Millions of people can access this. And as a species, as human beings, we're reflecting what it means for us because it speaks to us and communicates with us as a human being would do. And that makes us reflect as a species. So it's quite incredible and also I think it's quite ironic that whilst we are debating today potential scenarios facing the planet and our societies and the decades ahead, we accept that chat GBT and AI today is not replacing humans. It's not exceeded human capability. But in one sense, it's got one up on us because we're all sitting here thinking we're not quite sure how to respond to AI. <laughs> and I think Willie Rennie made a very important point when he says as politicians, as parliaments, we have to show humility. And I think we do have to do that. And we have to act thoughtfully. We have to continue to debate and listen in and out with this chamber. And I think the government has an essential role to play as well to represent the interests of all our people. But we don't have the answers. And I think that's been reflected by many of the contributions today. Sure. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful for the minister to give way. Is it not the fact that AI is actually the automation of decision making that actually we find so challenging that speaks to what a lot of people have already commented on about the lack of transparency as to how that decision or on what basis that decision was made. And that in itself is innately a fearful thing. Minister. Yes, and of course, that takes us on to the debate around trustworthy AI, ethical AI, and so on. And I know Michelle Thompson and other colleagues mentioned the Scottish Future Forums recently published toolkit to look at those issues, which I actually thought was very valuable. And it got me thinking about a lot of the issues and flagged up some issues that the government and the, the public sector in particular should be thinking about as we look as to how to operate AI and, and use it effectively in our country. But I think what we're experiencing just now in Parliament and across the world is this balance between excitement and fear. On the one hand, we're excited because we can see the potential for AI to improve our world, to improve our, improve our quality of life, to improve the Scottish economy. 
we can see how the knowledge revolution can be used to improve education. But likewise, we've got some fears because we can see some threats and risks. Singularity, which is, as we said before, the word used to say that machine learning means the machine can think for itself and does not meet human intervention and can develop its own intelligence is clearly something we have to think deeply about as a human species. Then we think of the impact on jobs. It can create jobs, but it can remove jobs. We can think of the impact on security, on cybersecurity, on countries getting access to AI and other bad actors on the planet to use it for nefarious purposes. And we know that is deadly serious. And others mentioned the arms race across the world at the moment of who can get there first and use these new technologies first. And we don't want the wrong people to get there first because that could have all kinds of ramifications for, for the world. Yep. Only I, I Carson. appreciate the Mr. Kevin. You know, I've, I've touched on it before that but data is the essential fuel that drives AI. Without data, AI doesn't function. Do you believe that the, the current uh, data policies within the Scottish uh, Government are fit for the, the purpose for the future to maximise the, the advantages that AI can bring? And is it, does it play a part in when, for example, that the Government are uh, looking to uh, develop a, a £92 million rural a payment system. Does that form part of your, your decision making? Minister. Well, clearly we have to think about those issues in terms of how we manage and access data in this country. But because we're debating today, we're not quite sure what the future is. It's quite difficult to answer that question because we don't know what the future is. So we have to constantly evolve and adapt as we learn about the consequences and potential of AI moving forward, and I think that's really important. And Willie Rennie mentioned the importance for politicians and parliaments to have good advice. And that's why I am pleased we do have the AI Alliance in Scotland. And it's chaired by the very talented Katrina Campbell, who is an expert in human computer interaction and a successful entrepreneur and has a number of um, incredible jobs, uh, uh, not just in Scotland, but she's uh, working elsewhere in the UK just now as well. Uh, but she's the new chair of the AI Alliance, working with colleagues. And as I said in my opening remarks, we're asking them to review where Scotland is with AI in terms of the potential for our economy, but also how we manage it going forward to make sure we manage the risks at the same time. And I have to give a wee plug to her book that she published last year, AI by Design, because I met her yesterday at the Data Lab in, in Edinburgh. And it's called AI by Design, A Plan for Living with Artificial Intelligence. So a Scot's written this book. And it's worth a read, and I did my best to get through it last night after she gave me a, a copy in preparation for this debate. And, and it goes through all the various debates and opportunities facing Scotland and indeed the wider debate across the, the globe as well. In terms of jobs, I think that is a big feature of uh, this debate. Uh, Claire Adamson and others mentioned that in the Industrial Revolution, we had people fearful for losing their jobs, but we had old jobs lost and new jobs created. And that is the story of history. And of course, the Luddites were mentioned in terms of worried about the impact of textile machinery and their livelihoods, eh, and so on and so forth. But we have to make sure that people are equipped for AI in their current jobs in Scotland, where that's possible. And we have to make sure as a country we've got the skills to create the new AI jobs and the new employment opportunities in this country eh, at the same time. Yeah. Michael I, think, I think it's a very good point the Minister makes in terms of the, uh, being prepared for this. But it's, it, part of the job of government in this is to ensure that we have those skills. And one of you have raised this issue time and again about the declining number of young people taking STEM subjects in secondary school. That has to surely be an absolute priority for this government if we're going to be able to cope with this situation to reverse that trend. Yeah, yeah. Minister. Again, it's an important point and it's something the government's addressing. It's something Skills Development Scotland's addressing. And I want to mention Ivan McKee in, in, in that uh, context as well, because he mentioned computing science being a concern of his, as it is for others in the chamber. Also, Mark Logan, our chief entrepreneur, in a recent meeting mentioned that he wants to see more support for computer science teachers as well, so we can meet the needs of the future Scottish economy. Indeed, we've got shortages at the moment. Uh, I think that is important. That's something we have to look at more seriously, and I'm up for that. And, my colleagues in the government are up for that as well, and the computing science uh, profession are working together to try and, and address that in our schools at the same time. And on the subject of Ivan McKee, I want to pay tribute to Ivan McKee because we do have many of the building blocks in Scotland to make sure as a nation we're ahead of the game 
and we're one of the leaders in the world in terms of exploiting AI for the benefit of society, the benefit of jobs, economic growth in this country. There's many building blocks been put in place. Ivan's not responsible for them all, but Ivan McKee has played a role over the last few years, and I want to pay tribute to him. And yesterday, when I was at the Data Lab here in Edinburgh and the Base Centre, I know Brian Hills, the Chief Executive Officer, is in the gallery today. Um, I was again amazed, even though I'd been before, I was amazed by everything I was learning. It's happening on our doorstep here in Edinburgh, here in Scotland. Not just in Edinburgh, other cities, other communities across the country. The research, the development is taking place. And, you know, we should be proud of the fact in terms of making the most of AI to improve our society. We are certainly in the lead. I think I've not got much time left, but I do want to mention the fact that AI has got the potential to transform our lives, is already but much more in the future, transform our economy and deliver enormous benefits. And I want to give a couple of examples of what are happening in the NHS, or maybe even just one example, just since uh, I'm running out of time. But um, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde's optimal projects investigating the use of AI to detect osteoporosis early. And another example, quickly, at the start of May, Beats in the West of Scotland started using an AI-enhanced linear accelerator to conduct better targeted, personalised and adaptive radiotherapy. There's many other examples happening using AI in our hospitals to detect cancer and treat it early and all kinds of ways. Must conclude, it Minister. Incredible. It's amazing. So AI has a lot of potential to improve our lives, to support our economy, economic growth, but it's really important we get the ethics right it's trustworthy, and we manage this as a parliament and as a country going forward and make sure we make the right decisions and we work globally in the global stage and with the UK government, our colleagues in Europe and, and across the international institutions as well to get this right for the interests of humanity. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on trustworthy, ethical and inclusive artificial intelligence, seizing opportunities for Scotland's people and businesses. It's time to move on to the next item of business and there are no questions to be put as a result of today's business and I close this meeting. <laughs>